This is Steve Fryer, and you're listening to the Inner Light Program. And with me as my guest today, live from the Transitions Book Place Cafe in Chicago at Sheffield and North Avenue, is Michael Schuster. Michael Schuster is a writer, lecturer, workshop leader, and author of two books, Continuous Energy and Upcoming Earth Changes and Conversations with Adolf Hitler. In this interview, we'll be focusing primarily on Michael's second book, Conversations with Adolf Hitler. And uh, let me read a little bit about the book. Conversations with Adolf Hitler, 1992 through 1994, reveals why the Holocaust happened in our time. It also offers Hitler's thoughts in life, as well as astounding descriptions of the afterlife. Through Hitler's own words, this and more is discussed, including his apologies to the Jews and other victims. This is the New Age, a time in our evolution when dialogue and revelations are available from spirit. Was Pearl Harbor a surprise to President Roosevelt? Was the Cold War fabricated? And whatever happened to Adolf Hitler? Adolf Hitler is one of the most analyzed and discussed um, personalities of our time. And uh, I really want to thank you, Michael, for having the, the guts to write this book. And, and, and welcome to Chicago. Thank you, Steve. I guess the first and most obvious question is uh, why would anyone write or want to write a book and call it Conversations with Adolf Hitler? And I, I have to say, after having read most of the book, that it is very enlightening despite its title. But it's very you know, a very unusual book, and I, I think the main thing that we'd like to know is why would you, uh, how did you get on track for writing this and why did you write it? I was not planning on writing a book about Adolf Hitler especially through Hitler's words. I was writing a book about my own experience recognizing my past life in Nazi Germany. I had been a Nazi in my past life. In this life, I had um, had a near-death experience. I actually died at age 19. And I, I came to realize years later I'm not the same soul that was born in my body. I popped into my body in 1964. Does that mean you're a walk-in? I'm a walk-in, yes. I popped into my body in 1964 believing I was still Jewish. And ultimately, I learned, in retrospect, I had to learn to love myself as a Jew so I could forgive myself as a Nazi. And that forgiveness process itself was of intense interest to Adolf Hitler. Now, the way the book began was I was simply writing a book about my walk-in experience, knowing myself as a Jew, knowing myself as a Nazi. And I had, in preparation for the book, done a fair bit of research on Nazi propaganda in the video movies uh, of the 1930s and 40s. Mm -hmm. And I was listening to the very first channeling of Adolf Hitler, which was channeled by a man who lives in Philadelphia. I was listening to this tape on my way back to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I lived at the time, and I was driving through the state of Philadelphia, the state of Pennsylvania, and a woman in the audience of that first channeling said, I am Jewish, and I forgive you. And I thought, oh, my God, had I forgiven myself? And I started to freak out. Mm -hmm. And at that moment of freaking out, I, I felt a voice in my head, <laughs> and I've gotten into the habit of answering those voices. I said, who's there? And the man said, I am Adolf Hitler. And I said, yes, I'm Santa Claus. But he insisted who he was. <laughs> At that moment, I said, what do you want? He said, I want to do a book through you. I said, why me? He said, because I needed to find somebody who was a Jew, who was a Nazi, who learned to love himself, forgive himself, and who could channel. Do you want the job? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. Then my soul popped into my head and said, Michael, if you take this job, there'll be no competition. <laughs> Nobody else wanted the job. So you got it. So I got it. Well, we should say that this uh, is a channeled book, and uh, some people may not know what a channeled book is uh, and, and or may not trust the material. How do we know this is really Adolf Hitler uh, or his soul speaking to us through this book, through it, you? I cannot prove this is Adolf Hitler coming through the book. But when one, if a person reads the book, I think they're convinced after the first chapter that this is indeed Adolf Hitler speaking through the book. In fact, I had an, a rabbi read the book, a well-known rabbi in the New Age community, and he was very skeptical, but after reading about 30 pages of the book, he was thoroughly convinced this is Adolf Hitler speaking because simply of the style of the mm -hmm. speech, the information brought forth, mm -hmm. and the attitude of Hitler at this time was very recognizable based on the film clips of him in the 1930s and 1940s. Why do we need this book? Uh, you know, it's whenever I've mentioned the title "Conversations with Adolf Hitler" to my friends, uh, I get a very weird reaction. They're going, "Well, why would anyone want to read this book? I mean, what's this is like a you know this is this is the the Antichrist. This is the man that turns everybody off. 
Why do we need this book, and why, why do you recommend people read it? Pre precisely because he is the Antichrist. And if the, anti if the nature of the Antichrist were understood, it's within every, it is within every soul on the earth. It's our dark side. It's our fears. Uh -huh. It's an aspect of ourselves that must emerge in the next few years to reach our potential. This book ties very much into the idea of earth changes and the need to balance the light and the dark within ourselves. It's really a book about personal empowerment, mm -hmm. self-love, and forgiveness, which is everybody's birthright, especially Adolf Hitler's and his need to forgive himself. In that context, it explores his path, but we see ourselves in his path to a degree. So you're, are you saying that in order to uh, achieve en enlightenment as a society or as individuals in the society, we need to examine our dark side and really really expose it to the light? Precisely, because the New Age focuses upon the light, upon love, upon positive thoughts, mm -hmm. positive thinking. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. But if you focus upon positive thinking exclusively with denial of our own dark side, mm -hmm. we become distorted in our, in our worldview. We're still in denial. So as Adolf Hitler approached his life, let me just read you one line from the sure. book that explores what I'm getting at. He has one line in here say, saying, from my perspective as Hitler, the Christ was the dark side of life because it was based on the false sense of mission that dealt with unconditional love. Further, he says in the next paragraph, I had misjudged Christ just as vehemently as I was fighting for the dignity of Lucifer. In that context, Hitler was the Antichrist because he was totally comfortable with the dark side as we would view it, but uncomfortable with the light. We, as not being an Antichrist, are more comfortable with the light, but afraid of the dark side. We must embrace both. That's very interesting. Uh, maybe it would be profitable for us to, uh, to know w why this soul called Hitler, Adolf Hitler, would take on this role. Uh, maybe there's something we should know about his, his past lives that led up to his incarnation as Adolf Hitler. Well, let me back up a bit. Uh, first of all, the, the statement that I just made, we must embrace both our dark side and our light, is derived from a sense of our future. In the next couple of years, we're going to be moving into an acceleration of consciousness mm -hmm. where we are inundated by vast spheres of light from angelic realms. Now, based upon our willingness to absorb that light, we must, we must be in, in a sense of balance to integrate the light because it will illuminate all of our shadows. If we are in denial of our shadows, we will repel aspects of that light. In that context, an, an Antichrist is welcomed to the earth every so often, Napoleon being the last mm -hmm. before Adolf Hitler. So Adolf Hitler was in preparation in several lifetimes to answer your question in the possible play of being an Antichrist, but he came from another dimension. He came from a star system in recent lives that we call Orion. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get into the nature of extraterrestrial civilizations too much, but on it's another book. It's another book. <laughs> but Orion has a strong background to Earth experience and Earth history, where the turn of the century, in our terms, 1890s, uh, the world decided to want to accelerate the consciousness of its inhabitants through the process of some somebody coming to the Earth who would give us the potential to perhaps purge negativity, mm -hmm. purge fears, bring out feelings, whether it be fear, anger, whether it be an outrage. That was the possibility of Hitler's birth because he didn't come here to be an antichrist. He came here to bring about a healing vibration for Germany. But because of his altered ego, because of his emerging insanity, which I can get into, he became more and more paranoid. He became unstoppable then as an antichrist figure, which led to a purging of what he called the blight. Um, just briefly, I, I'm, I'm wondering if we have uh, right now among us a, a, a current Antichrist. You say there have been a series of Antichrists uh, on the planet to help us bring out our dark side, and that's beneficial. Is there someone that you know of that uh, would fulfill that role right now? There's speculation of an Antichrist figure living at this time in um, the Middle East, Perhaps he was born in Pakistan or India. I, don't, I can't confirm this, but Hitler talks about the current Antichrist, the third in a series. It will be revealed in the next five years who this Antichrist is. I don't know that much about it to give the question an authoritative answer. I just speculate. I believe there is an Antichrist figure alive. Tell you, I don't know who it is. Well, maybe it's a suggestion for a, a new book. Perhaps. <laughs> perhaps. A future book. <laughs> I guess uh, you know what's interesting to me is is uh, the man Hitler. Who who was he really? 
Can we get into that a little bit? Well, he was human like we were while he was on the earth, but he came from other dimensions where he had explored extremes in the, the, the virtues of being a warrior, in a sense. Mm -hmm. he, he blew it on other star systems. He came to the earth as his redemption. But as he became... He blew it. He blew it, obviously, on the earth. <laughs> we, kind of, we kind of think he blew it here, too. <laughs> yes, because... Well, the, well, he blew it because he... In a sense, this is answering the question of who was Adolf Hitler, who was the man. Mm -hmm. He blew it because he got into his ego to such an extreme, he thought he was indispensable. He thought he was a god unto himself, which, he, which everybody is, but he failed to recognize the value of others being gods equal to himself. That was where he went to skew. Now, the man was an extraterrestrial warrior in the flesh of human design, in a sense. Those were his own words, as I recall. Okay. He came from a star system most recently called Orion, and he came here to bring about a healing for the German economy, but as he became more and more powerful, and he became more and more and more, more moved by the adulation of the masses of Germany, he began to move away from economics as his initial agenda into the agenda of purification of the Aryan race, pure blood, and total violence justifiable toward his ends of a perfected society. His roots in this lifetime have to stem from his childhood where he was beaten by his father. His mm -hmm. mother would doted upon him. He learned to respect force and he loathed weakness. And as he was beaten, he swore up and down in a silent way. He would move beyond himself in changing the world into his ideal. His ideal was a perfected society of Aryan superiority. Now, the man was outside of time, just as many geniuses were in this century, such as Einstein or Nikola Tesla. He was a man out of time. He had qualities that most humans don't have of an intense concentration, a strong will, an undeviating will, and he used observation in life to observe the masses, their weaknesses and their strengths, to observe political terror tactics of the political parties of the time, to reach his ideal of becoming the, the head of the Third Reich, which he saw as his job because the world needed his personality. He was, for the most part, a dimensional traveler through worlds, but so are we. Mm -hmm. He was a man who blew it on other star systems, but so have we. He's a man who now look, likes to find love and self-forgiveness in his heart, and so do we. So basically he's an aspect of who and what we are, although he is the epitome of evil in his time. But yet, ironically, while he was alive, he didn't believe in evil. He didn't try it on for size until he died, and he felt the, ju the, world, the judgment of the world on his soul. So mm -hmm. in, many, in many respects, Adolf Hitler is just an exaggerated aspect of who we are, who came to the earth to bring about social change. It was uncertain before his birth how that change would take place. The rest turned out as it did. In your, in your work, I know you do a lot of uh, channeling of, of different kinds of entities and so forth, and, and light beings. Um, it sounds like we're still dealing with choice here, uh, even though it, it may look to some people like there is a time track and, mm -hmm. and that uh, certain events are predestined and so forth. How do you see the, uh, history unfolding? Is, is there, do, we, do we really play a role as individuals in we, determining the future? We play a role in our own lives. Our future is just the trend of our present thoughts and feelings. And because humans had been in denial of their thoughts and feelings for thousands of years, the Holocaust was made possible. The question becomes, in the New Age philosophy, do we create our own reality or don't we? If we create our own reality, who would have volunteered for a role in the Holocaust, either as a Nazi or a Jew? That, that's the most controversial aspect of the book. But I maintain before birth, we chose our parts. We chose to be German. We chose to be Jewish. We chose to be a gypsy or a Pole. We chose our path for the probabilities that would unravel and the Holocaust was one of those probabilities. So you're saying uh, the so-called victims of the Holocaust uh, were, were volunteers in a, in a manner of speaking? And since they were a volunteer for their own soul need to end the cycle of powerlessness because the healing of the Holocaust takes part in the next life. That's where this is all very confusing. If, if a life is chosen where there are no choices, where one dies at the hands of the dastardly Nazis, they die, they reincarnate, mm -hmm. they're much more sensitive than to giving their power away in the subsequent life, which is right now. So that's what's going on now. That will now we're much more sensitive to the lessons of the Holocaust. That's true. I mean, we, we, we hear about it all the time. It right. won't go away. Right. Maybe that's why. That's one of the reasons. <laughs> that's why it was allowed. Because we have free will to choose those kinds of lives. Mm -hmm. Nobody moves us in and out of those lives by force. We chose those lives before we're born. We do have free will, but a good portion of our free will is chosen before we're even born. 
by the choice of our parents and our circumstances in the next life. I kind of thought the uh, the theory that I like is that we we choose our parents and we choose the cir- the circumstances into which we're born. Uh-huh. Uh, how does that stack up with what you found out? Well, I do a lot of past life regressions in the work I do, and we absolutely choose our parents before we're born. If you can believe in reincarnation in the first place, because <laughs> our parents will set up the emotional parameters of our lifetime, but we also choose the life circumstances of the emotional parameters of our lifetime. And it gets back to the earlier statement that a life was chosen in the in the virtues of the Holocaust. In a sense, I'm calling it a virtue; it's a perverted term here, but in the in the aspects of the Holocaust, it brought about an outrage in that life. It would sensitize the soul in subsequent lives not to give one's power away as they had in the past. So those that were attracted both on the Nazi side and the Jewish side had been giving their power away for various reasons. Um, where is Hitler now? I mean, this is, this is probably, if you believe in reincarnation, if you believe in the afterlife, and you've contacted the soul of Adolf Hitler, what have, uh, what have you found out about where he is now? And, and then I have another question. Did he, did he actually go to hell in the Christian sense? Whatever happened to Adolf Hitler? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, what happened to him was he created a hell for himself because he didn't believe in evil while he was alive. He, he was very sincere in what his, he was trying to accomplish in the purification of the Aryan race, a master race, even though it seemed as very limiting at this time. In his life, he saw it as very, a very serious quest. Upon his death, he did die in 1945 in the bunker. He shot himself at putting a a gun in his mouth. Before that, he shot uh, Eva Brown and shot himself in the mouth, had his confidants dispose of his body in a, in a fire outside the bunker. And upon his initial death experience, he found himself surprised to recognize he was conscious the whole momentum of his death. He never lost consciousness. <laughs> he saw himself looking down upon his body. These are in his own words, in a sense. Mm-hmm. And he recognized he was in a strange space, in his own words, and he reflected upon his life as Adolf Hitler in the Fuhrer. And what infuriated him was his failure to accomplish his goals of the completion of and the maintenance of the Third Reich initially. But then, after a short while of being, quote, dead, unquote, he felt the judgment of the world on his soul. And how could he now forgive himself when he felt the judgment of, his, of the mass consciousness of the earth onto his soul? So he started to believe in evil for the first time. He, he, he in a sense, diverted his attention by trying to deflect the judgment, but he couldn't. So he created a series of bunkers through his emerging insanity. He was insane when he died. He was insane after he died. His insanity grew by leaps and bounds after he was dead. He created a space that he claims was in, was in a star system, in a sense, to insulate him with, from his rage from other aspects, of, other aspects of the astral realms. So he created a hell for himself. There is no hell of permanent status, but there are hellish environments when one dies, based upon one's thoughts and feelings and activities mm-hmm. in life. Mm-hmm. So he created the ultimate hell in his, in, her, in his circumstances after he died. And he has just recently, more or less, quote, escaped from his own hell by learning to realize his birthright is one of self-forgiveness, just as everybody else's. So he had his lessons to learn from this experience as well. His lessons were yeah. much more intense than our lessons, <laughs> although that could be argued because what were the uh-huh. lessons of those that suffered in the Holocaust? Oh, yeah. And, uh, or, this, or just the ones that went through the war. And, right, and, 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 I, and, and as died. an aside, the book does not deny the reality of the Holocaust one iota. It happened, and there were perhaps five to six million Jews that died, but there were also perhaps 10 million Russians that died. And under were, Stalin. Under right? Stalin. Right. Well, right. under Stalin and in war, wartime atrocities of starvation and battle of soldiers I'm talking about as well. 30 million, 30 million people died in the war, mm-hmm. at least. Estimates are as high as 60 million people. It was a purging that would prepare for the millennium that we're in right now toward the end of the 1900s. It was a purging of negativity by creating a very negative environment for those to participate in, to recognize what their choices would be as they emerge into the potentials of the earth changes. So perhaps um, that's one of the reasons we had the peace movement during the Vietnam era. Uh, Certain people didn't choose to participate in that kind of a scenario. Which to me seemed like it was artificially created by the military industrial yes, complex, as World War II might have been. It was indeed. The book gets into that. Mm-hmm. Very uh, interesting. It, it's an interesting notion that if we observe the momentum of war in, in the world, if for, perhaps, let's say, if in the Middle Ages, if the warlords of the Middle Ages had an atomic bomb at their disposal, <laughs> how long would it have taken them to drop the bomb? 
perhaps three minutes. <laughs> three seconds. Three seconds. So now we have evolved. We have even evolved. though That's even true. though World War II and the Holocaust was totally outside of time, it was out of context. It was a horror in the 20th century, just 50 years ago. But it came to us not out of coincidence. It came to us out of the need in the human society mm -hmm. to recognize the need then to observe a more balanced environment of not being afraid of our dark side. Well, are are you saying that the the war, World War II, we're speaking about here in particular? It sounds like you're saying it was a catharsis. It was a way to uh, to uh, have the dark side come out, yes. really come out, so we could really look at it, examine it, and release it. Right. But in a way, are you also saying that uh, this type of war was divinely ordained or created? It wasn't. How, how it was wasn't it created? It wasn't divinely ordained, but it was allowed. Allowed. Okay. It was allowed by our soul, by our Creator, because of the need for a purging, because of the need for a catharsis, because of the need for a blowout, because throughout history, humans have been afraid of their own feelings. What will bring out the feelings if not a holocaust? And what would happen, uh, what, how, how, how has the lack of being in touch with our feelings affected us over the ages? It has created illness and death prematurely, even though the medical modern science has us alive for ever increasing years. If we were not in resistance, we could live to 200 and 300 years. And we will in the future. Um, I happen to be paging through uh, the conversations with Adolf in Hitler book, and I came upon a, a passage, uh, it was chapter 15, called The Soul Emerges. And here you're talking about um, the final human challenges is, is to understand the will. And uh, you're saying there's three stages that maybe you could explain that. In two minutes, <laughs> I can't. I can't remember exactly what I wrote in there. Okay, the what it, well, what it says here is before moving into the next dimension, uh, we need to integrate the next the three stages of the will. The first one is just the creator's impetus to be. Uh -huh. Number two is um, the uh, inception of the intellect, which it seems like where most of us are at. Right. We live in a very intellectual world. Right. And and then the final is the feeling level or knowing stage, which would. Uh, uh, indicate divinity or in ascension, I, I would guess. So basically we have to integrate the will in terms of feelings, in terms of intellect, exactly, and to be or not to be. That's what, that was taken care of by our Creator. We decided to be. We are because God is. And so in that context, it's this, this dilemma is played out in, in Star Wars all around the cosmos. There are star systems that focus upon intellect. There are star systems that, systems that focus upon intuition and feelings. We are a star system on the Earth that has the availability of both. We are a grand experiment in cosmic terms. So that makes us unique. We are very unique mm -hmm. because of the capacity to integrate the heart within our logic. That's a big play. That's a big play in the cosmos. <laughs> this this is fascinating. How how does what what's happening here on planet Earth this this drama this play uh, how is this going to affect the rest of the universe? Is there any way of knowing that? First of all, well, if we we have to get into projections of the future, which I that's my expert. That's, that's one of your. That's one of my specialties. That's your thing, right? I can't prove any of this, of course, because it doesn't lend itself to proof. But I have learned to meditate. I've learned to go out of body. I've studied self hypnosis. I go out of body into the future, which I'm talking about tonight at transitions in about two hours. But basically, what I see in the future, in a summary statement, is that we're going through an acceleration of consciousness, where time is speeding up. As time speeds up, like we become more telepathic. As we become more telepathic, we have the potential to heal ourselves and heal the earth in a sense because we recognize we are the earth. And through all of that, there's an inundation of light that comes from angelic realms and from our soul and from the earth and extraterrestrial dimensions. And when we're, when we're inundated with light, all of our shadows are exposed. If we are still in denial at that point of our feelings, we are limiting ourselves in the, per, in the perceptions of potential in the next few years. But the ultimate potential is to ascend in this time. Uh, you said Hitler created his own hell. I think a lot of the listeners uh, uh, to this program are probably going to wonder why God didn't just just slap him around. Why didn't God put him in hell? Uh, what is the nature of reality, really? What have you found out through your um, your investigation of well, the other side? I'll answer this question based on my own experience with being dead for 15 minutes and being conscious. While I was dead, I flew out of a car at 60 miles an hour. I was dead, head first. And while I was dead, I moved through a tunnel. There was no time, there was no space, but I felt waves of unconditional love, during which time I, I emerged with, into my soul awakening, awareness. While I was my soul, there was no empty space. All there was was the unconditional love of the creation. In my breath, in my surroundings, all there was was God. There was nothing outside of God. That means that good and evil is a great distortion. 
In yeah. what way? That means there cannot be evil because all is God. Otherwise, it wouldn't be all that is. So within all it is, there are events that seem to be evil. There seems to be hell. There seems to be heaven. But the whole nature of polarities of good and evil, light and dark, are polarities of the third dimension. When we move into the fourth dimension... I mean, is it real enough in the third dimension? In the third dimension, it seems real. But even in the third dimension, I'm seeing it as an illusion. Mm -hmm. It's very real to us, just as the physical world you know, is real to us. But when I was there, I could see the illusion of the physical world. I could see the illusion of fear. I could see the illusion of time and space. The only thing that was eternal was the nature of change. Change itself is the only nature that's eternal in the creation. Change and everybody's loved by the creation because we're aspects of the creation. But when I was when I was dead, I could realize in no uncertain terms we are all God. We're the goddess. We're all that is. While we are born, we agree to a time track to incarnate onto. We agree to be male or female. We choose our parents before we're born. We choose our circumstances before we're born. Once we find ourselves on earth, we are individualized because we have ego here. And Hitler embodied the sense of the greatest altered ego in recent history. Out of control. Out of control. But basically, <clears throat> what I learned from my own death experience is there is no good, there is no evil. There's nothing outside of the creation. And what's the kicker is when I was dead, I realized... Nothing is spiritual or unspiritual because it's all spiritual, regardless of how we would judge it. It's human judgment that creates these distinctions. Basically, when Hitler died, he found out there was no hell other than his own hell because he felt he had to be judged, because he felt the judgment of the earth onto his soul. But even he came out of his hell after seeming a seeming struggle for, in our terms, 50 years or 49 years, but in his terms, it was eternal. Because you create more time to maintain your insanity as well as space. So he never, in that, in that context, in that, in that environment. it would seem eternal to him. To and him. Will I ever get out of this? And right. That, that is a form of hell. Right. That was his hell. So in that context, there is a hell, but God does not punish us. We punish ourselves. So he punished himself. Is that, is that sort of like the law of karma? Now, he, he did all this evil to other people. Does that mean that if, if I did evil to you, if I, let's say, killed you right now or tortured you and then killed you, um, I, that I would create my own hell? You'd create your own karmic yourself? way to balance those those seeming atrocities. Now, I killed lots of people in World War II. I worked in concentration camps. Well, why aren't you paying for that? Well, I am. I'm oh, paying for it right here for? by telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so this this is why you have this job. That's right. Of running around small bookstores and, and lecturing for that's, little that's or no money. Correct. <laughs> uh, that's correct. Tr isn't that true? Now, interestingly enough, if you consider the evolution of religion on the earth, religion is always the perfect reflection of humans' evolution of their consciousness at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, at this time frame, if you get into a fundamentalist time understanding of, of God, God is a judgmental God, it looks down upon us and right. judges us, hell, fire, damnation, and you better forgive. You better, you better forgive your, 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 yourself, in a sense, for all your sins. But Jesus never talked about sin. He talked about self-love. He talked about self-forgiveness. He talked about self-respect. Self-esteem. So, so you're saying the fundamentalists are sort of approaching it from the negative, from a uh, negative, point distorted of view. view, but they would consider my point of view contrary. So I don't judge or, or label the fundamentalists as any less than my truth. We all have our own truth, but, just, as, but, but as we grow and we expand our reality, everybody's right. Nobody's it's, wrong. It's just another approach. It's simply a different approach. My approach is one of realizing the more unconditional we are. I come, I've come to the conclusion that our entire reality is a reflection of how much self-love we allow into our life. Self-love embodies the idea of self-forgiveness and unconditional love to ourselves and all that we encounter. It's not what religion talks about, unfortunately. Most religion talks about hellfire and damnation. It's a distortion of truth in my understanding. That's just my approach. What have you learned from Adolf Hitler in terms of this concept of self-love and, and forgiveness? Um, that, his, that his challenges are just like ours. We all seek to love ourselves to deeper levels, and so does he, but to an extreme because we don't have the challenges. When, 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 when one dies and moves through their life review process, there's the opportunity to address the impact of his life on all those that he impacted, which was 30 million people. So that's why he went into a series of bunkers. But we. You mean in the astral world? In the astral world. That's the, the nature of the life review. We don't have that extreme. So we got, did he get to feel all the pain that he caused all these other to people? To his degree of capacity to feel, yes. Mm -hmm. But he, because he couldn't feel it all, that was that was one aspect of his insanity. This is, see, this is what uh, Danny and Brinkley says. He had a couple of near-death experiences mm -hmm. as well, and uh, you know he was involved with the CIA and he did a lot of He's reading killings book and as rituals. We speak. I gave him the book at a conference. I He's reading at, your book. Yeah, I gave him the book. We spoke <laughs> at the same conference at the International Prophecy Conference in Philadelphia 
last month. I got a chance to ask him a few questions, and I, uh-huh. you know, I, I read his, his his major book, and uh, that's what he says. During the life review, you will experience briefly all the pain that you caused to all the other individuals. It wasn't so brief to Adolf Hitler, unfortunately. Uh, well, for I him, imagine it's like a for us it was like fortunate a, because it was part of his learning. Right. <sighs> this is this is just absolutely fascinating to me. Um, how someone wouldn't want to read this book <laughs> if they really knew what was in it. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. It, it, is, it, you know, it really is an enlightening book. The next um, version of the next edition of the book will be retitled Ultimate Forgiveness, Hitler Speaks, 1992 to 1994, because the title Conversations mm-hmm. with Adolf Hitler leaves the reader open yeah. to believing this is an evil book. It's too, yeah, it's too, uh, too open-ended. Yeah, I think that would be It's a, very be open-ended. Good. But I... Um, we're not done yet. We still have time to go. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, let's let's talk about uh, Hitler's soul. You know, in in the book toward you know, toward the latter part of the book, you you, you got into uh, where he's at now. In other words, he's kind of going through this self healing process and uh, gotten over the guilt and the pain and the suffering that he caused himself and other people. Yes. And uh, I got the sense. Uh, you were really starting to channel his higher self or his higher higher level of soul or a more evolved soul. Yes. What was that like for you? Well, it happened in, in stages. and After a while, I was, I was getting answers from Hitler. They were pretty elevated answers. I thought, my goodness, he's come a long way. But then I realized it wasn't Hitler. The personality that was coming through was the soul. The soul of Hitler is a student of Merlin, Merlin the magician in a sense, who, comes, who comes around at times of great <laughs> social change to help people get off the fence. Do they love themselves or do they not? Are they taking back their own power or do they want to give their power away infinitely longer or creating more time to do so? So Merlin is a cosmic player like a, like an angel or an angelic realm who comes to the earth at times to bring about the potential for balance. That's his specialty is balance. And so his soul is a student of Merlin. And I, I learned that channeling Adolf Hitler and then channeling his soul, it doesn't matter if I'm channeling your soul, my soul, Jesus Christ, or the soul of Adolf Hitler, the, the information is the same. The bottom line of, of, of life is self-love, and self-love implies the ability to forgive ourselves and forgive all, regardless of how evil they seem to be in life. So is this what the uh, the gurus talk about when, when we're talking about the concept of oversoul? Yes. As we evolve, we sort of uh, become more and more one with that the universal consciousness, or what some people would call the Christ consciousness? Well, the, the challenge of creation <laughs> itself is to bring heaven to earth in our case, or bring the spirit to the realms of the physical. So it's a little little different than ascending and getting out of here. It's We're trying really, to bring it in. It's really bringing it in and anchoring, the physical. It, anchoring it on the earth and the physical, because mm-hmm. when we ascend, we don't go anywhere to ascend. We ascend in our body right here in the flesh. And in that context, Hitler helped in his own way, as, as perverse as it was, he helped to bring about a scenario to question aspects of life in a very an outrageous way. How could a man like Adolf Hitler be allowed to come to the earth at this time? How could a Holocaust be allowed by God? Where was his soul in that aspect? Well, his soul addresses that question where I ask his soul, where were you when Hitler was ordering the death squads <laughs> in, in Russia in the concentration camp scenario? Mm-hmm. And his soul question. said, a soul does not interfere. God does not interfere. A soul in God allows, allows us to learn that whatever virtue of the, how we choose to set up the lessons of our life and the Holocaust was a lesson of how outrageous we can become via the idea of altered ego because the Antichrist has a greatly altered ego. That's the benchmark of an Antichrist. But we all have an altered ego on the earth at this time. Sure we do. That's why a man of his qualifications came to the earth when he did to address the question. <clears throat> so what do you see in um, Adolf Hitler's future? Well, he desires to come back to the earth, but he's not being allowed to. <laughs> Is that for, for safety's sake? Well, you think he, he might uh, fall again? And The and, guides uh, out there want to make sure he's learned his lessons. <laughs> Meanwhile... How are they doing that? Well, they're monitoring him in conversations in endless, endless schools of the astral world. Now, I was, his, I was his spirit guide for a year. You don't have to be dead to be somebody's guide somebody alive you can be alive and be somebody's guide or somebody who's dead and i don't brag that's, about being that's, able to that's kind of a switch guide. it's kind of a perverse sense of um <laughs> guidance here <laughs> but i was sparring with hitler intellectually uh-huh. because his he was very much in denial not so much denial of the holocaust but it didn't happen in terms we assume it happened because he's living in a spiritual world where the physical scene as an illusion so in that context he saw the holocaust as an illusion is an illusion only truth between those and those between himself and those who died in very individual terms 
But I told him on the earth, you've got to assume the Holocaust happened in our ter- in our terms, in our terms of how we view death. We don't see death as an illusion on the earth. We see mass uh, suicide or genocide as an, an extreme in insensitivity to human to humans. And he has to address then the earth and in, in how we address those same questions. And that was my initial role with him, to have him admit and acknowledge that in the human terms he was evil. But in his terms, he sees evil as an illusion. And so it was quite a series of conversations that took place even in the preparation of this book. <laughs> so I see even even now, after he's, he's done some healing work, um, he may be a little de- more detached, which I imagine most souls, from what I've read, well, uh, do detach once they uh, lose the physical body. The, the, the interesting part of the book is, I want to conclude with this statement for this segment, in his surrender, I was teaching him the virtue of surrender, but he didn't want to hear about surrender. Adolf Hitler surrendering, give me a break. But he, it was not surrender of his arms, but it was surrender of his will in the moment to the unknown qualities of his soul that could find inner peace because he was very stressed when, I, when he introduced himself to me. He was extremely stressed. So <laughs> I basically, I taught him the virtues of surrender, and he ultimately did surrender in, in the end of the book. And who greets him as he surrenders but the Christ? And what happens when he meets Jesus in his surrender path? Jesus hugs him. It's a merging of the Christ and the Antichrist. That's going to be all of our extremes as we enter the fourth and fifth dimensions. We must merge with the Antichrist within all of us. It's the same response I gave earlier. So in a sense, this this is a template for what's about to happen on a mass scale for all of us. Yes, it's a template. Hitler was a catalyst then um, for all of us. You know what? <laughs> Shopping cart got loose <laughs> in the parking lot. <laughs> um, I recently uh, read the book Conversations with God by Neil Walsh, and uh, he says Hitler never went to hell, so to speak. And I guess you know it, it well, depends it depend- on the context. Well, it depends that- on one's context of, under- of answering the question. He went to his own hell, but there's no hell for him to go to. There's no heaven either. It's a state of mind. Right, that's, I think that's, uh, it's gotta be explained to the average person that, uh, hell is a state of mind. And it's, so is heaven, but place. earth provides the opportunity to be in a hellish earth or a, or a heavenly earth, depending upon our happiness quotient. You know, in the book you have one chapter devoted, Michael, to, uh, some conversations with some of the other World War II leaders, such as FDR and Mussolini and Stalin. And I was curious to, from your point of view, who you thought was the most interesting uh, of the other characters in the play, and Winston Churchill as well. Um, and, and what was what? What did you learn? What do you think? It, what did you well, put the stuff in the book? I felt that I would channel these other players, such as Eva Brown came through, mm-hmm. uh, Stalin, Mussolini, uh, Churchill, and um, FDR, because I want to get President Franklin Roosevelt's response to Pearl Harbor. I wanted to get Stalin's response to the Cold War. I wanted to get Mussolini's response to being a partner of Hitler early in the game. They all filled in the book, but it all overlapped in a very interesting way. I found Stalin's uh, dictation quite fascinating to me because he gets into the Cold War and the communistic viewpoint of the Cold War from his perception, of course, being the leader of the Soviet Union in those years. Mm -hmm. And he sees the Cold War very, very differently than we do. He sees America as the aggressor. He sees Russia taking a defensive posture. He was still angry that during World War II, no country would come to the aid of Russia when they were being invaded by, by the Nazi regime. So how were we the aggressor if uh, the Nazis invaded Russia? He was, no, he was talking about in the context of the background to the World War II. Not that we were the I don't, I don't I don't agree with everything he said, first of all. Well, could you get into but what you feel is the real background? The, the real background was... To World War II? Uh, wars are not made for violations of space or even to free the slaves in terms of the Civil War. Wars are created for economic reasons, for simply the motive of profit, because wars are very profitable. And it was learned years ago through Napoleon's marches that if you can finance a drive, the booty in return, the payoff is tremendous, but you supply both sides of the armies (laughs) at the same time simultaneously, it's a very profitable business. And so the American corporate giants of the American military industrial complex that Eisenhower war- warned us about. It's really the background of what Stalin talked about. Stalin talked about the corruption in America, and he said that communism and fascism as well was a response to the arrogance of the capitalists, who present a very pristine perception of free will, of survival of the fittest, of 
competition being the glory of the modern day. Darwinianism and uh, Malthusianism and, and these concepts? Well, you can, you can look at Stalin's perception based upon his view that he had, he had an awareness of the corruptions of the democracy and his perception. Now, you have to understand this is still Stalin talking that I'm quoting here <laughs> or remembering, paraphrasing here. Men who killed how many million of he his killed, own he, people? He, he killed several million of his own people, but... 10, 20? Well, it's hard to say. Yeah. But meanwhile, uh, the, the whole war was a facade because you can indict Standard Oil of New Jersey. You can indict the Chase Manhattan Bank. You can indict General Motors, even Ford Corporation. You can indict the biggest corporate giants in America for supplying the Nazis with arms and jet f and fuel for their airplanes throughout the war. Throughout, throughout the war, war. Throughout, not just before the war. Throughout the war into 1945, if you tra if you there are books out called Trading with the Enemy as an example, I've where, heard of where it. it traces mm -hmm. the trading of the biggest corporate giants with Nazi interest throughout the war because simply it was profitable. And, and Stalin is aware of this uh, facade of capitalism, mm -hmm. and he talks about it in his response to the Cold War. He's saying that it was a facade in that. There was not the animosity uh, between America and Russia that the newspapers in America talked about, but there was indeed ample room to keep up a wartime economy in a time of peace. How could the how could the world keep up a wartime economy after World War II? That was the reason for the Cold War, because it's profitable to maintain an enemy for both Russia and American interests and British and French, etc. And we had Vietnam. Or, we had uh, Vietnam because Korea business was Vietnam. slow. So Vietnam was created. Well, now we're, we're into Bosnia. Now we're into Bosnia in the same way, but it's a little bit downscale compared to Vietnam or or World War II. Well, you can see they're having a little trouble drumming support for it. Clinton is. There's a book called Last Waltz of the Tyrants mm -hmm. that gets into Napoleon's influence and how it has stretched into the current day because war is a profitable business. And all of the players, whether it was FDR, whether it was Stalin, whether it was Mussolini or Churchill, talked about the aspects of war that does not reach the press. You have to read between the lines and do your own research to come to these conclusions. But this is my conclusion for sure. And Stalin offers the best explanation of the facade of the Cold War of all the other players. A lot of people believe that uh, FDR was uh, well aware of the uh, impending attack on Pearl Harbor, or the possibility of it at least. I asked him that question in the book, and he says he, had, he acknowledges he knew about Pearl Harbor before it happened. But he was powerless to do anything about it because he needed the response of the military industrial complex even at that time to fight off the threat of not only Nazi Germany but Japan, the two, the two fascist powers of, in the world at that time. What do you think would happen if we hadn't gone to war uh, to fight Hitler or, uh, or Japan? That would have been a sad case indeed for the status of our lives at this time. If, if Hitler had gone unabated as well as the fascist rulers, the warlords of Japan, we'd be living in a very different world at this time with no Jews, no gypsies, no creation, I mean, no creativity. We'd be living in a, in a, in a world that's very sterile of the diversity of the creation. One of, our, one of our lessons at this time on the earth is to enjoy and appreciate the diversity of the creation as opposed to eliminating aspects of that diversity because it doesn't meet our fancy in the moment. Well, our time has just about come to a close, Michael, and I really, really want to thank you for taking the time to do this interview. And this is a book that I highly recommend. And if you have a final word, you've got a few, few seconds. And it's been a pleasure talking to you, Steve, and thank you so much for offering me the opportunity to give a balanced uh, overview of this book that is very controversial indeed, as I'm discovering as I travel around the country <laughs> speaking of the book. I hope you get a chance to, uh, to speak about it uh, in some other venues. And uh, perhaps we'll leave the door open for you to come back and we'll discuss your other book. Continuous Energy and the Upcoming Earth Changes, which is Thank also you. a very fascinating book from what I've seen. Thank you.